Well, good morning, church. I am so excited this morning as we start a brand new journey through some passages of Scripture. And in this journey, we will be looking at a lot of the places in the New Testament where the statement one another comes up. So it's a sermon series called One Another, looking at all these places which speaks about the role of Christian community. Uh, and there's quite a few of these one another statements. Turns out it's like a hundred of them. So don't worry, this is not going to be a hundred week series. Uh, we'll just be looking at a few of these one another statements. But on that, uh, you might have heard this in the pre-service lobby, me talking about uh, the fact that we have a daily devotional guide to go with this series. Once again, Shelley Saylor has written daily devotions going through a lot of the one another statements. So by the end of our series, you will have personally, if you've gone through the daily devotions, gone through all the one another statements, and on Sundays, we'll be preaching through some of these one another statements. So let me just give you an idea of some of these one another statements. So, for example, here's an obvious one. Comes up quite a lot of times in the New Testament, the command to love one another, to be devoted to one another, honor one another, accept one another, instruct one another. That'll be interesting. Greet one another. Side note, comes up five times, always with, with a holy kiss. Maybe we need to talk about that at some point. Care for one another. Serve one another. Carry one another's burdens. Bear with one another. Be kind to one another. Submit to one another, what does that mean? Esteem, edify, encourage one another, confess your sins to one another, pray for one another, show hospitality to one another and fellowship with one another, plus a whole bunch more. That's not even to mention some of the negative one another statements, so some one another's that you should not do. For example, do not but or devour one another, one of the scriptures says, and one wonders as to the circumstances that would require that to be articulated. It seems then, when you consider these hundred one another statements in the New Testament, it seems then that there is a one anotherness to the Christian life. That as it turns out, the Christian life is not just about me and my relationship with God, but also about me and my relationship with other Christians. In other words, as we zoom back a little bit this morning, what it means is that there is no such thing as Christianity in isolation. The New Testament has no expression for a Christianity that is purely found expressed in isolation. There is a one anotherness to our faith. And that's pretty much all I wanted to do today is to convince you of that. Before we get next week into these one another statements is to show you that a one anotherness is not just a nice, sweet add-on to the Christian life. It's not even just another package of commands to add to the list of commands, but at one anotherness is intrinsic to the very idea of being a Christian. And to convince you of that, we're going to have a look today at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. So just a few verses. So turn there, or turn or tap in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read from verse 11 and get to the few verses at the end that we're going to be focusing on. So Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 11. And it says this, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, uh, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, 
having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances so that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to you who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. And then the verses that we're going to concentrate on this morning. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now, one of the reasons that I chose to read all the way back from verse 11, not just because it coincided with our wonderful Heritage Day readings, but because verse 11 marks a transition point in Paul's argument in this great chapter of Ephesians 2. So if you read verses 1 to 10 of Ephesians 2, it is all about your individual salvation. And it includes some of those beautiful words about what it means to be saved through faith in Jesus Christ. For example, words that says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, is those beautiful words about the love that God has for you and for me as individuals and how he saved us as individuals. That's verse 1 to 10. But verse 11 to 22 switches immediately without any break from talking about you and your relationship with God to right away you and your relationship with other believers. And this is fundamental. I want to pause and do a little bit of deep foundation work before we get into the rest of this passage there, because it's fundamental. We cannot talk about our relationship with each other as Christians, about Christian community, about church, about fellowship, about coming back together. We cannot talk about our relationship with other Christians without first realizing that our relationship with each other and all that comes with that, all the responsibilities and duties, the one another's, that that relationship with each other comes as a result of our relationship with God. These two sets of relationships with God and with others are inseparable. They do not exist in isolation from each other. In other words, there is no relationship with God that does not lead to relationship with other believers. There's no way that that exists. And there is also no chance of real relationship with other believers, especially when it comes to issues of diversity, which is raised in that passage. There's no chance of real relationship with other believers if it is not first for our individual relationship with God. That's the flow of Ephesians chapter 2. 
while you are saved individually through faith in Christ Jesus, you are saved into community with other believers. Now, you may not have known that. Maybe you're watching and you've just become a Christian kind of recently and it was this experience of you with you and God and the Holy Spirit and knowing you needed Jesus and you came to this beautiful saving relationship and you did not know that that would automatically result in you being incorporated into a community of believers. If so, surprise! <laughs> it was in the fine print all along. Although it's not really fun, Brent, because it's right here, always, always in the Bible, being saved as individuals or immediately leads to being incorporated into community. And listen, tight community. You know, often we use this word Christian fellowship, and what we mean by fellowship is you know, go to the street cafe and have coffee afterwards, like that's fellowship. No, no, no. The picture of community, of Christian fellowship is tight. Notice how the language shifts through that passage that we read. So it starts with this idea of the, the Gentiles being outside and separated and lost and lonely. And then it starts to bring them together that through Jesus brought near. So now you are no longer strangers separated. Now you are fellow citizens, members of the household of God, part of this growing temple. Notice how that language, it kind of, it broadens from being scattered and it starts to take shape. Now, through Jesus, you who once were far away, you've been brought in, now you are part of a new nation, a new race. That, that is what it means. When it says fellow citizens, it means you're now part of what is a, a new kind of people. Fellow citizens. It reminds me of during this lockdown period, as we've all waited for these presidential announcements, and probably the part that I've loved the most about those announcements, because generally there hasn't been much good news in them, the part that I've loved the most is when Cyril opens with, my fellow South Africans. You are now fellow citizens talking about you've been brought into this new race, this new nation, this new people. And then it narrows even further from a nation which is quite big to part of the household of God. It's getting closer. Relationships are getting more intimate. And then it narrows even further to being built, to being cemented with others into a temple. In other words, if you look at these three metaphors, a nation, a family, temple, no matter how you look at this idea, no matter which metaphor you choose to use, being saved by Jesus means being incorporated into community that is extremely close. And out of that, out of this relationship with each other, come these responsibilities, these one another's. We have this mutual obligation to each other that comes out of this relationship. And again, maybe you didn't know that. You know, okay, I know I'm saved by Jesus into community, but I didn't realize that there were some strings attached. Again, surprise. Again, it's in the full small print, but not really, because it's here every single time. Our mutual responsibility that comes with our relationship with each other, that comes from our relationship with God. So, for example, the Westminster Confession of Faith is this really ancient uh, 17th century confession of faith that a lot of statements of faith are still to this day made from, speaks about this idea of Christian fellowship. I love how it puts it. It's not going to be on the screen. So just listen to what it says. It says, all saints, meaning believers, nothing we're just literally believers, all saints that are united to Jesus Christ their head by His Spirit and by faith have fellowship with Him, Jesus, in His graces, His sufferings, death, 
resurrection and glory. So great. Personal individual salvation and being united to one another in love. They have, listen to this, they have communion in each other's gifts and graces and are obliged to the performance of such duties, public and private, as do conduce to their mutual good, both the inward and outward man. So maybe missed a lot. That's a, a lot of words in there. But I just love this idea that now united together in love, they have communion in each other's gifts and graces. So much of what we're going to talk about in this series is exactly that idea. We are now living together in each other's gifts and graces for mutual good, in both the outer and inward sense. It pretty much sums up the one another's. So, our responsibilities to each other, one anotherness, comes because of our intrinsic relationship with each other that comes because of our individual, personal relationship with God. I hope that that makes sense. What I want to do with the rest of our time today is unpack these three metaphors that come out of Ephesians 2 that speak so much about our community, our relationship with each other, and the responsibilities that come with that. So, he has these three metaphors. Let's unpack them. First, Ephesians 2 describes us, you were scattered, but now through Jesus brought together. You are now fellow citizens. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about this one because uh, in the But Why series, just a few months back, I think it was in March, preached on this passage and actually spoke about this. But I do want to remind you of it, especially as we're in Heritage Month, as Ndaba said, and on Heritage Day weekend. And some of you are out on holiday and enjoying the long weekend. And uh, so I do want to remind you of just how important this idea is. So what I said then back in March is this idea of one new man being created in the place of two is this idea of one new race fellow citizens what that means is that as Christians we now have a new primary cultural identifier this is what I spoke about in March you used your primary cultural identifier used to be black, white, Asian, Indian, colored. Now your new primary cultural identifier is Christian. That's what this means, a new race, Christian, your primary cultural identifier. What that means is that, for example, you go to home affairs or anywhere and you're filling out those forms which asks for what race are you and you've got the, bar, you know, the blocks, white, black, Indian, colored, Asian, that instead of ticking one of those blocks, you should tick the block that says, I'm a Christian. Except that there is no box for that, right? So then you have to then tick the box of your secondary cultural identifier. Again, let me remind you, I said in March, what this means practically is that I, me, I have more in common with a black, elderly, Christian woman living in rural KwaZulu-Natal than I do have in common with a white, middle-aged male living in Joburg who's not a Christian. That's how deep this new primary cultural identifier goes. So on Heritage Day, we celebrate secondary cultural identifiers. And, and that's not to mean that they are unimportant. They're amazing. God has made us that way. And we love to celebrate our diversity. But on Sundays, we gather together to celebrate our primary cultural identifier, which is this new race, this new man, this fellow citizens of the kingdom of God. So that's the first metaphor. What that means for us as being 
fellow citizens. So second metaphor, I want to spend some time on this one today. Where it describes us as not just members of a, a new nation, but members of the household of God. Which is very much, obviously, a family metaphor. And the metaphor of family is perhaps one of the most common metaphors used in the Bible to describe the church, to describe Christianity. We are family. Now, I know that for some of you, that may not seem particularly attractive because maybe you have had a negative family experience. But when the Bible speaks about us as fellow Christians being family, here is what it is supposed to mean. So two things connected. One, supposed to mean belonging. Belonging. One of our greatest needs as human beings is the need to feel loved, accepted, and safe with the people around us. Our greatest human need. Family is supposed to provide that, being loved, accepted, and safe. You may not have it, with your physical family, with your nuclear family, with your mother and father and brothers and sisters or children. But when we talk about church as family, when the Bible talks about church as family, what it's describing is the ideal that Christian community becomes the place where you can feel loved, accepted, and safe. In other words, church is supposed to be a place where you can belong. Just think about that statement. Somewhere I belong. I can belong here. What, what does it mean? If I feel like I belong here, it means like I, I feel I fit in. I fit in. So I'm accepted, comfortable, safe fit in and have a part to play here, a purpose. And throughout life, people long for this, long to find a place where they can belong, where they can feel they fit in, are loved, and accepted, and safe. And when it's not there, there's this nagging sense, this great tension, this emptiness. And so much of our lives is spent trying to find that. So whether it's in those difficult school years, or in university, or in the workplace, or in our family, mostly people go through life feeling unaccepted and insecure and it drives us to do some crazy things we do things we are not supposed to in order to feel accepted we are driven to perform and succeed in order to feel like we have worth and are secure and safe it even drives us to kind of this insane passion like where we identify with sports teams not connected to us kind of at all but just trying to belong to something greater some some cause that is great beyond ourselves the fact that we now as christians the fact that we have been brought together by jesus through Jesus and are very much together in Jesus means you now belong. You can belong. I remember for me this was such a massive transition in my story as a Christian. In my personal relationship with Jesus just knowing that I was loved and accepted and secure in Him, but finding expression of that in 
Christian community was probably one of the greatest changes in my life that took place. Finding a place where I belonged. So when the Bible talks about us as being members of the household of God, being family in Christ, what it means is, what it should mean is you are loved and accepted and safe. Now what that means, this metaphor, is of course that's why the most common one another statement is love one another. Does it make sense in a family kind of metaphor that love would be dominant? If we can love one another in a way that each other can feel safe and secure and accepted and loved, then all of the others flow from that. That's why love one another is the most repeated one another statement. It comes out of this context of this family metaphor. Secondly, that leads to this next point about church community as family. And especially those that find that difficult, perhaps you have a difficult family background. Because what this family metaphor means, and just remember, this is the most common metaphor used of church is family. What it means is, it implies that fellow Christians have a deep, deep personal relationship with each other. I mean deep. Let me tell you something that may come as, come as a bit of a shock to you. It was a, it was a surprise to me when I first realized this just a little while back. Here's something to think about. Well, just like our primary cultural identifier is no longer our national cultural identifier, but our Christian cultural identifier, just in the same way, our primary familial Identify. In other words, the primary way that we should think about and use the word family is no longer our nuclear physical family unit, but should be the family of believers in Jesus. Let me put that in some plainer language. When the New Testament talks about family, talks about family of believers first and the nuclear family second. Now just take a deep breath there. What that does not mean is that the nuclear family, mother, father, husband, wife, children, it does not mean that the nuclear family is insignificant. But I think the church in general with the very best intentions, has often elevated something really important, the nuclear family, but elevated it to a place of it being primary. Whereas the shocking reality of the New Testament, as I'm starting to see, is that while it affirms the nuclear family, it actually places a lot more weight and emphasis on the family of believers. That does not mean that we downgrade the importance of the nuclear family. What it does mean is we have to upgrade the importance of the family of believers known as the church. So I want to convince you of that and do that. I'm just going to quick hit us a couple of verses that I think really self-explanatory on this. So Jesus, in Matthew 12, verse 46 to 50, it records this about him. It says, So while Jesus was speaking to the people, the crowds, behold, his mother and his brothers, his nuclear family, stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, But who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. I think it's quite self-explanatory. Paul. So Jesus, Paul, you will have noticed all over his letters, hundreds of times writes to fellow Christians as my brother and sister. 
you know, these days we say that to each other as Christians. Hey, brother, sister, we mean it. No, 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 he meant it seriously. It's, it's a familial connection. He so often addressed people with terms loaded with affection, deep affection and love. He would talk about my heart yearns to be with you. That sounds like, you know, a man writing to a woman that he's in love with. And he's obviously, this is not sexual, but what it does mean is that the way he describes a relationship is it's way deeper and casual. That's how Paul describes his relationship with other Christians. For example, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16 to 17, which we're going to celebrate in communion in a little bit, says the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? And because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake in one bread. Newsflash, when he talks about one body, there's fellow believers coming to partake in the one bread. It's the same phrase for husband and wife being one body. In other words, oneness, which we rightly use to describe marriage, is not used exclusively for marriage, but used of relationships between Christians. And again, I feel like this shouldn't need to be said, just like it perhaps shouldn't need to be said that we shouldn't bite or devour one another, but I'm going to say it anyway. This is not sexual, otherwise you could some weird cults come out of this, but what he is describing is a kind of relationship, a depth of relationship between Christians that is far greater than casual, far greater than coffee at the street cafe after the service. Lastly, even in the Old Testament, it speaks about this. A verse that was so comforting to me in my single years, quite a few years, quite a long time of waiting as a single person. So Isaiah 56, verse 45. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs, so those who can't marry, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house, my home, and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. In my single years, this meant so much to me. I just desperately desired to be in relationship, to be married, to have children. And here was this description of, hey, in the household of God, to those who are obedient and faithful believers, something greater than that is promised. And perhaps there's a few of you out there that, that can mean so much to you. And it seems almost crazy. How could that be true? Surely there's nothing better. This is how the Bible talks about family of believers. So we have to reckon with this. And essentially what that means is we have to take all of our good intentions, all of our good desires, all of our energy that we rightly point towards the nuclear family and take that same energy and desire and motivations and make sure that we also direct it towards the family of believers, the church. Did you pick up what I said? Because that's heavy. Just think about how much tension and focus and time and what you put into nuclear family, rightly so. But if we're reading the New Testament correctly, it at the very least says that that same month, of attention, at the very least, should be given towards the family of believers, which is why there are over 100 one another statements. Ta-da! That's where they come from. This idea of we're in relationship with each other and it's really close and there's just so much responsibility that comes with it. If you understand it in the family metaphor that is often used in the Bible, well... It just makes sense. Lastly, a holy temple in the Lord. So what does it mean to be a nation, family, and a temple? I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Maybe save some of these for a later sermon. But what it means to be a temple as believers? Firstly, holy. That's why a lot of one another's are about dealing with our sinfulness. Next week, Justin's going to start right away with that what it means to be a holy temple. Together we help each other be holy. It also means this idea of holy temple that we can expect 
when Christians are together, the presence of God. And I say that because we're on this journey now towards gathering back together. It's going to be a slow journey, a long journey. The 18th of October, we'll have our worship services in person as well as our online. It's going to take a long time for a lot of people to feel comfortable coming back, and we understand that. But we want to recognize that this idea of Christian community being a holy temple in the very essence of that metaphor means you can expect that there is a qualitative difference in our experience of the presence of God when we're together and when we're alone. So I want to end with that today. We're going to push pause here for a second. I'm going to pray for us as we start this journey together and then we're going to prepare to take communion together. And don't worry, there'll be some time if you're at home to gather the elements as well. But let's first pray that before we even partake of this bread and blood of Christ that joins us together, that we recognize today that that's exactly what it's going to do. Not just affirm our faith in Christ and join us with Him, but join us to each other. So let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning just for this reminder of just how closely you have brought us together. And we remember that ultimately you are not just about reconciling individuals to you, but about forming a people, a kingdom for your name, for your fame, for your glory. God, I pray simply this morning, especially for those who feel isolated, scattered, who perhaps feel unloved or unaccepted or insecure around other people. God, would this church be a place where people can feel loved and accepted and safe and have a sense of purpose, a place where they can belong. Jesus, through your Holy Spirit, I know Holy Spirit, in your word you have said that you're in the business of drawing people together. And so would you even now draw us together as a church? as we ponder, as we are about to celebrate our relationship with you, Jesus, we know that that means you're going to incorporate us into beautiful community. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.